requiring or at least listing as preferreds in a lot of the job announcements is commitment to diversity or experience in diversity. And there are ways, and I hope that I can give you some examples of what you can do. Because I have to tell you, and I'm going to tell you from the very beginning, you do not have to be a member of an uh, ethnic racial minority to be culturally competent. So, you know, let's start with, let's start with that premise. You do not have to be, and you don't have to be intimidated by the idea or the topic, topic of cultural competencies. Now, why is this important? Our country, and I, I think it's evident in the southeast, it's evident everywhere I go, our country is changing. When they did the 2005 census updates, People of color now surpass 100 million people in this country. That means that one out of every three residents is a minority person. And by that, I'm talking about ethnic racial minority. In fact, in, in, including the, the District of Columbia, there are four states. There are four states. I always go, there are four states. There are four states that now have an emerging majority, meaning there are more minorities in that state than non-minorities. That's Hawaii, California, New Mexico, Texas, and Florida. And they're saying that uh, New York and some other uh, northeastern uh, uh, state is going to probably hit that by 2015. This is why it's important because when you have a growing population of people of color and we work in one of the best professions, I think, the one of the best service professions in this country, and part of that service, part of that service is reaching out to the large minority groups that you might have in the type of library that you're working in. How many of you students hope to work in, and if you want to, if you want to do all libraries, raise your hand three, four times. How many of you plan to work in public libraries? Okay. How many of you plan to work in academic libraries? All right. How many, and you can raise your hand more than once. How many plan to work in school libraries? Okay, so it's pretty even. Yeah. Special libraries, special libraries, archives. All right. And of the practitioners here, of the practitioners here, how many of you work in public libraries? Okay. Academic? Pretty even. School? We have people from school? Okay. Uh, did I see a hand over there? Okay. There you go. Thank you. You know what? You guys are all even. <coughs> same, same numbers. And anybody from special libraries? Okay. All right. Two of Three of you. Well, almost even. Okay, thank you very much for, for sharing that information with me. The point is it doesn't matter what type of library that you're working in. These changing demographics are going to affect all types of libraries. Probably more so, I would say, right now with public libraries. And where the challenge arises and why it's tied to cultural competencies is there is a vast number, a vast number of people of color in, in the service areas of public, library, of public libraries that are underserved. And if we truly believe, as I do, if we truly believe that an informed population in this country helps us maintain our democratic principles, then we need to make sure that that one-third of the population, that that one-third of the population are lifelong learners and are part of the informed public. And that we can become lifelong learners in school libraries or through school libraries, 
through public libraries, through academic libraries. It doesn't matter what type of library you, a person might be um, used to or where they learned how to use libraries. The fact of the matter is, is when you know how to use a library, you are a lifelong learner. You know exactly where you have to go to learn more about, to get information about something to learn more uh, about that particular topic. Now this is just a breakdown, uh, and this is based on the 2000 population. Uh, and, and actually in 2000 we had not hit the 100 million mark, but by 2005 we had. And it's, it's, it's pretty interesting because I have to tell you that I'm always surprised. I'm always surprised when I get to a community and, and I, ha I expect, uh, and, and there might be um, a predominant uh, minority representation in that community. I'm always surprised when I pass by a carniceria. We passed by two of them, didn't we? Steve, where are you? Didn't we at least pass one or two? Um, you know, I mean, we are everywhere now. We are everywhere now. And it's interesting also, it's interesting also to see how our demographics change even in small communities. I gave a presentation not too long ago, and um, I'm trying to remember what it was on, and I'll think about it in probably just a second, but one of the charts that I had, oh, I was trying to show them how you could go to the census, uh, the fact finder, I think it's called, of the U.S. Census, and you can go and you can pick your community, pick a community, and you can show the demographics of the community. And um, and I, it was actually a literacy. It was a literacy talk. And I wanted to show because there are a lot of of uh, of our minority groups have a very very high illiteracy rate in this country. And so I picked my hometown where I grew up in. And I would have to tell you that when I grew up there. We were, um, the Hispanic population in that small community of about 3,500 uh, was maybe about 20 to 20, I think maybe 20 to 25 percent. Definitely a minority. So I, I picked my community, I asked my assistant to do, go into Fact Finder and get me all the information about the community um, relative to to educational rates and uh, and the minority makeup and, and things like that. I was shocked. There are now, in terms of that community population, 52% of my hometown community is now Hispanic. I was absolutely shocked. I mean, that was, you know, that was a, that was a, uh, that brought it home to me about how the demographics change quite dramatically. Now I want to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what I mean by ethnic racial diversity. Because I want you to know that I embrace all types of diversity. I mean diversity is a lot more than just this particular, this particular variable. Uh, you know we have gender diversity, we have GLBTR diversity, we have differently abled diversity, we have all kinds of diversity, and all of those are important. All of those are important. But for the topic tonight, I'm focusing on ethnic and racial diversity. And so for me, um, this particular definition in terms of the difference between uh, diversity for me, ethnic and racial diversity, is the difference between people based on a set of beliefs, uh, norms, it could be language, it could be customs, ethnicity, uh, and or race, any of those uh, individually or collectively that identifies, that identifies um, uh, those people as belonging to a certain group. And that's sort of an academic de definition, but I wanted to make sure that I listed things other than just ethnicity and, and race when I'm talking about ethnic and racial diversity.